Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Emily, chef and coordinator at the New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital's Teaching Kitchen. And today's class is focused on cooling summer dishes. Thank you so much for joining me here today on this very hot day. I think we couldn't have picked a better time to do this class. Uh, yesterday, we did a class where I was using almost every burner and the broiler and it got so hot in here and the timing of this class is perfect because it is hot outside. So for those days where you just don't want to turn your oven on or you just don't want to work on the stove or you just want something that's a little bit lighter and refreshing and um, features, you know, some of the nice summer produce it doesn't really need to be cooked in order to be enjoyed. Um, that's really what this class is about. So um, I get a lot of questions about sort of what's the story with raw food and um, certainly everything that we're cooking today is, would be uh, classified as a raw food. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that and health benefits, risks, et cetera. Um, but just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And Alita, who is moderating our program today, will read them to me. I certainly encourage your questions and participation. And um, if anyone has any favorite kind of cooling summer dishes that they want to share with our group here, feel free to put them in the chat and tell us what you're making in your own kitchens. That's really nice, easy kind of cooling summer stuff. So there's a difference between raw foodism and raw veganism. So I just want to kind of clarify that difference. So raw foodism is the dietary practice of eating only uncooked, unprocessed foods. So that includes raw foods like fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, but it also includes eggs, fish, meat, and dairy products. That's raw foodism. It can also include sprouted seeds, cheese, fermented foods. And then raw veganism consists of raw plant foods that have not been heated above Usually the window is 104 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the belief there is that foods cooked above this temperature lose a lot of their nutritional value and it's less healthy for the body. So that's the argument for a raw veganism. Um, there's not a lot of substantial evidence that suggests that that's the best diet for us. Um, in fact, I believe that everybody is different and it could be beneficial to include some raw foods and certainly there's a lot of um, great natural enzymes and there are vitamins and minerals that are heat sensitive, like vitamin C, for example, when you cook it um, or you cook a food that's high in vitamin C, it, it definitely breaks down the vitamin C. So there are some, um, some fruits and vegetables that contain these heat sensitive vitamins that um, break down. So, all to say, I really think that a nice, well-rounded plate of food that has some raw stuff, some cooked stuff, you know, maybe, maybe your meal is cooked, but you're having a little fruit salad for dessert. All of that is going to get you those vitamins and minerals intact. And um, I don't really subscribe to, you know, eating everything raw, especially in, um, in the winter months. I'm always really puzzled by um, people who do juice cleanses in January uh, because they want to, you know, New Year cleanse everything. Winter is when we're supposed to be having like cozy cooked stews and, you know, lots of warming foods to kind of get us through the winter. So um, the best time to enjoy, you know, these raw foods are when they are abundant in our environment. And that's going to be, you know, spring and summer. Um, do we have any questions about that? Everybody makes sense to everyone. I get a lot of um, I get a lot of questions from from people saying, should I, you know, should I try a raw food diet? And you know, I, I again, I don't really recommend it, but I am rec I certainly recommend including more raw foods in your diet as part of a complete um, kind of picture. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. We're going to be making three recipes today, and I better get started because we have a lot to do. Um, the first is we're going to be making is, um, well, we're going to start with dessert first today. <laughs> so we're going to, making a, going to be making a strawberry lime cheesecake that is raw. We're going to be making a crust from almonds, just raw almonds, um, medjool dates. I didn't actually have the medjool dates, so I got the regular dates that are pitted. 
And the regular dates aren't as juicy as the medjool dates, but you can make the substitution. But one of the things that I did to help kind of juice them up a little bit um, is I just soak them in a little bit of water for 20 minutes just to get them a little bit juicier. But I'm going to drain that water off. And actually, sometimes it's useful to save it, um, to save the, the water. And if you need to, you know, if you need to thin anything out, you have this sweetened water. So if I'm making the crust and I think, oh, it needs just a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of moisture, I can use that water from the soaked dates because it's sweet. You can also use this in a smoothie. Um, you know, you can pour, make your own tea out of it. It's like lightly sweetened from the dates. Okay, so we're going to begin our two workhorses for this class are going to be the food processor and the blender. Um, you can also see I have <laughs> a lot of spatulas because we're going to be using those and a bunch of bowls. So that's kind of what I really, all you really need to, to prep for this class. So we're going to start by opening the food processor. The other reason I'm starting with dessert first today is because um, I, I think it's a little bit easier. I don't want to like process things that are salty and then rinse it out and process something that's sweet. I'd rather go the other way if that makes any sense. So we're going to start by breaking down our almonds. It's going to be a little loud. I apologize. And you just want to break them down until they kind of resemble like a bread from, you know, mixer. Um, I oiled a, um, a pie pan, but you could use, as the instructions suggest, you can use a spray form pan. That's a lot easier, actually, if you have a spray form pan. It's a lot easier to kind of get the uh, pieces out. So, by the way, this is how you make almond butter. <laughs> if you've never made almond butter before, you would just let this keep going. And eventually, you can even maybe start to see on the bottom here, it's starting to kind of catch and form a layer. This is how you make almond butter. You just let it keep going until it's really, really nice and soft. So, if you wanted to start to make your own almond butter, sometimes less expensive. Okay, in go the dates. We're also going to add a little bit of vanilla extract and salt. I put them together so I wouldn't forget the salt. I often forget salt when I'm making sweet things, but it's actually really important because it helps to balance out the sweetness. And we're just going to pulse this together to form our crust. So much healthier than your butter and graham cracker crust, right? You're essentially just having um, almonds and dates, and you're done. Um, if you wanted to, sometimes I put different spices in the crust. I'll do like a cardamom or cinnamon or something like that. But you can, for this one, I kind of I kind of like it plain. But you can use this, you know, raw crust base for anything. Um, you know, any kind of like raw, if you wanted to pat it into, into a pie plate and just serve it with, you know, some spoonfuls of yogurt and fruit in it, that's really good. Um, so there's, it's quite versatile and it's really yummy because it's just almonds and dates and what can be better. <laughs> so I'm just going to use gloves because dates are really sticky. And I'm going to press this into the plate. So you want to make sure you get as much of that as possible. I'm using my hands as a spatula right now. And then everything else is going to, I have oiled this, um, oiled it lightly. I'm just going to let this soak just for a few minutes while I press this in. It's useful to oil the pie plate because it'll help you get the, um, or the spring form pan because it'll help you get this out later. So you just want to keep pressing it. It's a bit sticky. Again, the gloves are helpful. Um, if you wanted to, another trick to kind of get this not to stick as much to your fingers is to um, actually oil your gloves. So this is like a little olive oil. You could do this with your hands too, and that'll make it a lot easier to kind of press this into place. So far, so good, nice and easy. You can also throw some dust into this if you wanted to add like a little lime zest into your crust. Um, we already have the vanilla extract, which is really nice. And you can see, I'm just kind of going into the, into the corners of this and kind of pressing it up. Right. You could also get um, something with like a flat bottom, like um, like a measuring cup, something with a flat bottom, and you could kind of use that to press it so it gets a little more even. I kind of like the fingerprint look. <laughs> I don't know. I find that um, you should probably oil this too. I find that it's a little more rustic, as we say, a little more rustic. 
Okay, and you're not really gonna see the bottom anyway. The important thing is you kind of get it all around the edges. All right, so this is ready for our filling. Just kind of tapping everything into place so it's more or less the same thickness all around. That's all you're looking for. Gosh, this is fun, it's like Play-Doh. I can do this all day. I guess I do do this all day. <laughs> all right, let's get our filling ready. So. Here's our pie crust. We're gonna begin with the um, strawberry cheesecake filling. I'm just gonna slide this back so you can all see. I do want to try to pull this, do like a little do -si do with my machines here. Okay, there we go. So for this one, the Vitamix is very powerful. It's a very good blender. Um, if you don't have a Vitamix, then you can just use the best high powered blender you can kind of have in your, that you have in your kitchen, um, the Vitamix will get it really, really creamy and smooth. If you're not using a Vitamix, there are some other ones out there, just keep, you might have to blend it a little bit longer to get it the right consistency. So I have my raw cashews and they've been soaked. Now soaking nuts and seeds and grains and legumes, when you do that, you soak them even for 15 minutes or so. It helps to um, disinhibit what's called phytic acid, which is a naturally occurring, um, you know, a naturally occurring product in nuts, seeds, and legumes that renders them a little bit hard to digest. When you soak them, you break that down, makes them easier to digest, makes it easier to capture all of the nutrition from the nuts and seeds. So we've got our cashews. We're going to be adding, again, a little more vanilla extract in this going in here. We're gonna be adding some agave. So I don't often cook with agave. I'm using the um, organic light agave. I don't often cook with agave because it's not really my favorite sweetener. I prefer maple syrup and honey because they are less processed. But for this recipe, I've tried it and the maple syrup is a little overpowering and the honey is like too much of a honey flavor. I just wanted like, the sweetness without the flavor. So that's where agave can kind of work because it just kind of, um, it's sweet without it being like, oh, this is a lot of maple syrup or honey. I'm using some lime juice, about one to two tablespoons. We're gonna blend that with some strawberries. So let me get this started, pulse this a few times just to get going. And then we're gonna add for the strawberries, you just wanna cut them up, take the top off. Oops, I hid my knife. Take the top off. Then you can see here behind the blender and just kind of cut them into quarters. Okay, add your strawberries, about a cup of strawberries. These have all taken the tops off already. And then we're gonna add some coconut oil. Now you have to melt your coconut oil. So make sure that you do that. I'm putting it in the microwave down here. Everyone is always surprised that I have a microwave under the counter, but I think it's a genius design. I wish my microwave were like hidden out of view because it takes up a lot of space. It's kind of set a stage. Right, and now we blend. This is gonna make our filling. It is useful to have one of these. This is a tamper to push the berries down. So that's gonna add some juiciness. And just be patient. Let it kind of work its way down. It's gonna turn this a beautiful pink hue. There we go. Let's crank it up a little bit. Very, very thick. It's horrible. So it's important to keep it smooth um, what comes with your blender. Um, I, I once was at a place where, where someone, a, a restaurant where someone um, took a wooden spoon or a spatula and they stuck it in. Please don't do that because it can, you know, damage the blade of the blender. Okay, so here's our melted coconut oil. Oh, and I almost forgot a really important ingredient in here. But look, you're all following along. Half a cup of coconut cream. So that's going to help to make this a little bit thinner as well. Um, so I'm going to teach you how to make coconut cream. Very, very simple. I almost forgot because I'm keeping it in the refrigerator. So you wanna get your can opener. You wanna get your can of coconut milk and store it in the refrigerator overnight before you make this, 
right? So this has been in the refrigerator overnight. So it's been chilling out. And coconut cream, you open it and all of the cream should be at the top. So you just wanna be careful taking this um, part out because as you may know, the can tops are super sharp. I've, you know, I rarely cut myself with a kitchen knife, but the, the can tops like all the time. So we have our coconut cream. We're gonna get a spoon to just scoop out the creamy top part. So here we go. We don't wanna go too deep because we don't wanna take out the liquid at the bottom. We just wanna scoop out about half a cup of that cream. I have gotten this pretty much everywhere, but <laughs> I'm just kind of estimating half a cup. There we go. I love coconut anything. So yummy. Um, especially in this recipe, I don't find that the coconut is overpowering. It's really nice. All right, so let's get it. And you just want to let this blend until it's completely smooth and creamy. So as you can see, it's got this kind of nice velvety texture. Oh my gosh, I have to say the color is almost identical to Pepto-Bismol. This is not a Pepto-Bismol pie, I promise. <laughs> so you're going to pour that in. To taste it before you pour it in, see if it needs a little more sweetness for you. See if it's, you know, okay the way it is. I'm using a um, metal spoon here, but I really should be using a spatula. It's a lot easier to get, you know, as soon as you start getting in there with the spatula, you realize how much gets kind of trapped at the bottom. So try to get as much as you can, because trust me, you're not gonna wanna waste this. It's so yummy. Has anyone ever made a raw cheesecake before? Alita, I'm sure you have. Yes, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> Many, right? And they're so yes, yummy. I love it. <laughs> so we've got everything in there. We're going to set this in the fridge and let it chill. Our Pepto Bismol pie, I mean, our strawberry lime cheesecake. You can also, um, something that's kind of fun, hold on, let me put this in here, is to do this in two batches. So you could do half strawberries and half blueberries and blend them separately. And then you can kind of like pour half and half, or you can pour the strawberry and then the blueberry on top and kind of swirl them together. So you can have, you know, have fun with this, get creative and, you know, make something that's really beautiful and delicious. Questions or comments about this recipe so far? So good. Yeah, so the, How the, is the, everyone? The, the, there are a couple of um, questions. So um, Donata yeah. wants to know, are raw vegetables harder to digest? Donata, thank you for always asking the great questions. I appreciate it. Um, so they can be for some people. Um, they can be a little bit harder to digest. If you think about what cooking does, it's, it's kind of starting the digestive process of the food. So definitely for some people, um, the raw veggies can be much harder to digest than, than cooked veggies. Yeah, but it depends on the person. Yeah. So, so Gail wants to know if she could use almond flour. Hi, Gail. So, um, yes, you could probably use almond flour instead of the almonds. The almond flour, though, does not have the skin. Like the almond flour, I think the one I have, some of the almond flours do have the skin in them. I would look for the one with the skin because you, it's just adding more fiber. And, um, yeah, but you could probably make that substitution. I think What's the recipe set? One and a half cups, two cups of almonds. So I would probably start with like one and three quarter cup of almond flour because once those two cups of almonds break down and we're kind of compact and concentrated. So start with like one and a half, one and three quarters cup of the almond flour and see how you do with that. 
Thank you. And then Millie has a question about if you don't have a food processor, um, can they use the Vitamix to process the almonds, dates, you know? Um, you, oh, that's a tough question. Millie. If you don't have a food processor. Could you use the Vitamix? You probably could. It's just going to be really hard because it's going to be very, very sticky. It's going to be very, very sticky. I would almost suggest maybe instead, if you don't have a food processor, um, like using the almond flour that Gail mentioned, and then blending your dates with a little bit of water in the blender, and then combining them in a bowl by hand. I would probably, I would try that instead. Okay. Yeah. And then... What do you think, Alita? Do you agree so, with that? So, or, you know, what do you think? I, I've used the Vitamix to process some stuff when my yeah. processor wasn't working. And I just have to moderate it really well. But, you know, yeah. you need to know that machine very well. Otherwise, it's going to become a big mush. And then you're not going right. to have the, the crust the way you showed it. So, yeah. All you right. Know, Thank you. Uh, Alisa wants to know, can you use peaches? Peaches. Ooh, it's definitely peach season. Mm -hmm. You probably could, but peaches are very, very juicy. So just be careful. Maybe use a little bit, um, a little bit less. Like if you, if I have one cup of fresh strawberries, um, start with, I'm just afraid that it's going to be a little too wet. Mm -hmm. So you could start with like half a cup of peaches and just see how that goes and then take it from there. That's it. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just starting on our next recipe, the raw zucchini lasagna. So you can see I busted out my mandolin for this one. This is not the kind that you play on a, on a rainy day on your, por on your porch. This is the kind of mandolin that we have here in the kitchen. And you're just um, going to make these nice thin slices. It's going to act as our kind of pasta for our layers. So if you don't have a mandolin and you have a sharp kitchen knife, you can do this with a sharp knife. Just, it's a little bit harder. You have to have very good um, control. So if you see, I kind of, the way that I have this adjusted, this part on the back tells you how thick or thin you can twist it to adjust the thickness. The blade is very, very sharp. So just be careful. And I always kind of go away from myself push away. So I kind of like brace it against my body and push away. That's how I use the mandolin to make these nice slices. Okay. So I have a mix of zucchini and summer squash. These are going to be our kind of pasta layers. And then we're going to fill these with three different fillings. The first is the tomato sauce layer. And I say tomato sauce because it's not your traditional cooked over the stove tomato sauce. It's going to be walnuts. Let's add those in some little pinch of ma um, maple syrup or honey, just a little bit to sweeten it, just like in a regular tomato sauce, you might have a little bit of honey or, or, or something in there, sugar to sweeten it, right? We're gonna add a little, um, some basil, dry basil, that's the other thing I put in here, some fresh cherry tomatoes, some olives, so these are Kalamata olives that are pitted. Just make sure if you're buying pitted Kalamata olives, Give each one a little squeeze, make sure that there are no pits in there. I think I already did that. I hope I already did that. And then this is sun-dried tomatoes packed in oil. Now I'm draining off the oil. We're not really gonna use it. You can, if you want to. This recipe calls for two tablespoons of olive oil. If you wanna use the, you know, use the oil here, let's actually do it. Why not? I'll demonstrate. You can use the oil here, about two tablespoons of it to kind of get this, um, get this good flavor in there. It's completely edible. I like to um, actually save this and brush it over fish and roast fish in this kind of like infused um, olive oil, but this is a raw food class. So we're not gonna do that. All right, so we're not getting that going. One, two, save the rest of this. And you're done. That's layer number one. Again, with the spatulas. I can't believe I'm only already down to one spatula. Scrape it down the sides a little bit. Pulse it once more. And you do want it to kind of be, you know, some, some kind of like a, 
not a totally smooth texture. I, I like it if it's a little bit chunky. It almost looks like a tuna fish salad texture. It's got the same kind of like consistency and texture here. Okay, so that was tomato layer. Easy, right? Very, very easy. You can use this, I mean, you can use this as a dip. You don't have to layer this in your pasta, but I'll show you closely. I said pasta, I mean zucchini. We're using zucchini as pasta. So you can see the texture here. It does kind of cling. Oh, it smells so good. It smells like really like that wonderful cured tomato kind of like smell. Mm, love that. I recently exper been experimenting with um, um, dehydrating my own tomatoes. A friend of mine has a really great recipe that she shared with me. And um, it's, it's great. You just roast the tomatoes for like three hours and they get super flavorful. I put, I usually put a little bit of thyme and she also told me to put a pinch of sugar, which was really interesting and it worked out really well. Okay. Layer number two. Are you all ready? Everyone's like, I want to roast tomatoes now. Well, maybe that'll be another class. It does take three hours, so it would be challenging. Okay, our second layer is the cheese layer. So for this one, I have raw cashews. Again, this is the foundational layer, I think, of every, you know, raw food thing is going to be raw cashews. If you can't eat nuts and seeds, it, raw food is definitely a challenge because there's so many um, nuts and seeds in there. We're going to add some nutritional yeast. Maybe you're familiar with this. Nutritional yeast is a species of yeast. Um, it's grown specifically to be used as a food product. Unlike brewer's yeast or the yeast that you use to make bread that has to be cooked, this is grown specifically to use, be used as a food product. So straight from the container, you don't need to do anything to it. Um, it has a really nice kind of like cheesy and nutty flavor. So that's why we're using it today. And to produce it, these yeast cells are, are, they're grown for several days. They're deactivated at a low heat and then they're harvested. They're washed, they're dried, they're crumbled up and then they're packaged and put in this little container for you to take home. It's amazing how much happens behind the scenes when you start looking at our food system, you know, even just to get like olive oil and things that we use in our, in our basic household uses, you know? Um, there are two types of nutritional yeast. One is fortified. The other is unfortified. This one happens to be fortified. What does that mean? Usually um, B vitamins are sprinkled into it. So uh, the unfortified one does not contain any vitamins or minerals. I have no preference one over the other. It's usually a lot easier to buy and find the ones that are fortified than the ones that are unfortified. Um, either way, it is a good source of protein some trace minerals, and um, there's two grams of complete protein per tablespoon, so that's pretty cool. So we're gonna add that in, and guess what we're doing? It's gonna be our cheese layer. And you just wanna let it keep going until it starts to break down a little bit. Oh, I almost forgot. We're gonna add some fresh lemon juice. I'm gonna borrow this little sieve here. Fresh lemon juice. You want about two tablespoons. This is a very juicy lemon, so I think maybe half of the lemon should be fine. Two tablespoons. What's everybody cooking today? Is anybody making anything in our audience on this hot day? Salads, <laughs> just <laughs> gazpacho. We're making gazpacho tomorrow if anyone wants to come back and make that with me. It's my favorite surprise ingredient. I'm making strawberry lime cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> You are, <laughs> wherever did you get that idea? All right, go for it. There we go. Now it's starting to come together a little bit more. So you get bowl number two. The advantage of raw cooking is it really doesn't take much time. Everything's just kind of like blended or processed or something like that. It's pretty quick. So there we go. I'm letting it go until it starts to kind of come together a little bit more. Right now it's got this kind of almost like a sticky, you know, Play-Doh consistency, right? So you can taste it, see what it needs if you want. This is gonna be our crumbly cheesy layer. We'll kind of press that between each one. You can add a little more liquid. This is probably a little more crumbly than I would have liked, but that's fine. So our final layer is the pesto layer because you can't, in my opinion, make 
lasagna or have any Italian food without pesto because it's my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, I just harvested bushels and bushels of basil um, and for my own home garden, not the garden here. The garden here, we have wonderful tomatoes. Basil didn't do so well, but at home I have bushels of it. So I've been making pesto all week and, uh, and it's the season to do it. You know, you can make your pesto, you can freeze it. Um, I like to just label it. And anytime you want that kind of like it's the dead of winter and you're missing summer flavors, you can make yourself like a nice warming pasta with that wonderful summer pesto. Think ahead because your future self will thank you. Um, so basil is that leafy green herb. Of course, most of you know it. There are many different varieties um, and it's surprising the amount of vitamin A, vitamin K, um, calcium, iron and manganese, as well as antioxidants that basil has. It's a bit um, it's a bit alarming, <laughs> but in a good way. Uh, and of course, these anti-inflammatory properties, which we love to bring down inflammation with our herbs. Okay, we've got, I just put everything in one for this one. We've got our basil, we've got our pine nuts, we've got some olive oil, we've got some nutritional yeast. You could use Parmesan cheese if you wanted. I'm just being consistent with the yeast because I don't want you to go out and buy something and only have one use for it. So you can make, um, make pesto with it and use it for that. A little pinch of salt. This is our pesto layer. Done. Fresh basil going in here. I'm gonna wash a spatula because I knew that I would need a lot, but I did not know I would need this many. I took out three and I'm down to two. Oh, there's one back there, that's why. <laughs> okay, and you're done. So now that you have these three beautiful sauces, what on earth can you do with them? You're gonna layer them in your lasagna. So I'm gonna just scrape up all of that good pesto that we just made. And for, guess what? We're gonna use a food processor one last time to make a dip because I don't know about you, but I get a little tired of hummus. I love it, love it so much that I, eat it a lot. <laughs> so I like to have things that just kind of mix things up a little bit, offer some different nutrients and vitamins and minerals and all that good stuff that you're going to get from your nuts and your seeds. More protein um, in this dip too. Hummus has a lot of protein from the chickpeas, but this one has a little bit more because it's loaded with sunflower seeds, which I don't usually, I'm pretty good about eating the other nuts, the big ones, the almonds, the cashews, the walnuts, because it's easy to like grab a handful of those, you know, and just have them as a snack. But, um, but I'm not as good about eating, eating the sunflower seeds. So yeah, it's a nice option if you want to, um, if you want to make this and then you're making sure you're getting a diversity of nuts and seeds. Okay, so this is our meditative, therapeutic <laughs> lasagna making time. So you're going to take one layer and you want to make sure, you know, it lies flat on a plate and you can make these three sauces and then kind of build it right before serving it. So the way I start is, I just wanna make sure I'm being consistent. Okay, zucchini and then tomato. It's useful to have a few small spoons to do this, right? So you kinda of wanna spread a little of that tomato layer down. just about a quarter inch high. Okay, next layer is another zucchini or you can use a beautiful summer squash. Look how pretty that is. So nice, nice and yellow. All right, so that was layer number one. Layer number two is going to be, what do I have, the cheese. So you can kind of press this down between the layers. I kind of like to let it escape out onto the plate. I think it looks really pretty. I just decided that right now. <laughs> I like it because it looks nice. So pat it down a little bit. You'll do your pesto next. And same thing here, just kind of, I should have a spoon for this one too, it would make this easier. Kind of move it along. Okay, and those are your three layers. You can end with another um, squash on top. And you can serve this just as is, or you can try to build a little, little bit higher, but I find that this is, sufficient as a build. Three layers, one of each. See how pretty it is with the 
on the plate. And then if you want to, you know, finish with a little color, you can do some, I didn't save any basil leaves. I should have saved some basil leaves, but you can add a little, you know, a few little basil leaves or do, you know, a few drops of the pesto around. Okay, so you would keep going with this. You This makes um, quite a few. And then you can also just enjoy the nuts and seeds and pâtés. I, I know what I'm gonna be doing after class. Um, <laughs> you can just enjoy them on their own or, you know, in this kind of like nice layered format. And you kind of get like the satisfaction of lasagna because you've got those zucchini pieces that are acting as noodles. Um, I love to use zucchini instead of noodles. It's much more lower, you know, low carb. Um, if you're not used to doing that, you could also start by, you know, going half and half. If you're cooking, like if you're cooking a nice big pasta dish, chop up some zucchini and saute them and cook a little bit less pasta and just toss that together with whatever sauce you're making, just to sort of like try to introduce this idea that zucchini can be pasta. Although my Italian husband would vastly disagree. Uh, any questions or comments about any of that? Yeah, there, there's quite a few. So Beverly recommended okay. that um, that she would um, experiment with peach slices as a garnish on top of the strawberry or blueberry cheesecake. Oh, I like that, Beverly. That's a really nice idea. Yeah, Good thank idea. you for offering that. And then that would look really pretty. Yeah, Teresa wants to know what temperature would you roast the tomatoes? So Teresa, <laughs> um, actually, I don't know. I don't know if my friend who gave me this recipe is on. She did sign up for this class, but I don't know if she's on. Um, but if I'm remembering incorrectly, um, if she is on, she can adjust that in the chat. But I do 300 degrees and for three hours. So each tomato gets its own place on the sheet pan. Um, and then I dust it with a little salt and sugar some thyme, I just scatter thyme on the branches, I don't even bother picking them, and some olive oil, and roast it face side up for an hour, flip it face side down for an hour, flip it face side up for an hour. So Lita, if you caught all of that, I don't know if you did, but uh, feel free to put it in the chat, and I'm happy to repeat it as well. Okay, so um, Donata says that she made the mac and cheese with cashews from one of your classes. Oh she my said gosh. it was. She said it was delicious. She didn't see how cashews would be like cheese, but it was so good. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, cashews are just incredible because they can, as you can see, turn into this really delicious velvety sweet cheesecake. They can also turn into this delicious, you know, savory um, cheese that we're doing with our lasagna. So I'm so glad you tried it. That's an ambitious recipe. So good for you for, for making it. So, so, so our Denise, final recipe, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So Denise said that she's making roasted veggies um, and she said, thanks for keeping me company. She's gonna make oh. cheese, the cheese mixture you just made later on. Um, nice. And Beverly said that you asked for, you know, what, what are people making today? Yeah, so yeah. Coleslaw, raw carrots, raisin salad, along with a side of chicken salad supplied mm -hmm. by the Senior Nutrition Home Delivery Program for Peekskill residents. Who do you? <laughs> wow. Well, Beverly, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm so glad you're making those recipes. That's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that you're still in your kitchen cooking, making great things that are healthy for you and your, and your family. All right. So our final raw almond and sunflower pate. So same thing here, soaking your, um, your sunflower seeds and your, so this one I used half a cup of blanched or slivered almonds. So not the whole almonds. I suppose you could use the whole almonds, but I kind of like the slivered ones for this. So these have been soaked overnight. So I'm just draining all the water off as best I can into the food processor they go. And then we're adding just a few things here. Um, actually, let's use this strainer again to catch our lemon seeds. Lots of fresh lemon in raw cooking, which I love. I mean, I love lemon. Um, and of course, it just adds a lot of vitamin C, which is wonderful. And it smells so good. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. <laughs> and um, we know it's good for us too. So we've got our lemon, we've got our sunflower seeds, we've got our slivered blanched almonds. We're going to add a little bit of pickle juice. Now, I know this is a weird one, but it's actually really good because it adds a little bit of salt. Um, and it also has some probiotic material with that pickling. I'm gonna add, um, we're gonna start with that. Just wanna make sure, yes, 
Okay. And I'm going to wait to salt this until the end because pickles and pickle juice are a little salty. So I'm going to add that salt at the end. But first start kind of pulsing this together. I told you we we're going to use the food processor a lot today. You want it to get kind of broken down. Okay. Now it's starting to resemble the texture of breadcrumbs. Guess what I need? A spatula. <laughs> Let's tuck this down. I should, I should have called this class cooking with spatulas. <laughs> okay, now it's kind of the texture of breadcrumbs, right? I don't know if you can see, it's kind of like loose and crumbly. It looks a lot like tuna fish salad, which is crazy. And we're gonna add some shallot. So we're gonna add about um, two tablespoons of onion or shallot. We're gonna add some celery. So I've got this celery I'm going to use the leaves too because I like to try to use as much of the plant as possible. And um, a couple notes on celery. One of the ways in which I like to store it is and I feel like I need to go plant a tree now because I've used tinfoil twice in two days. But I like to wrap my celery in tinfoil. It stays really fresh for a long time in the fridge if you do that. So um, reuse the tinfoil, you know, as long as you possibly can. And then um, when it's time, you know, you can carry on. So I forgot to get parsley from the garden, but we're just going to pretend that I am added the parsley. Um, maybe I'll add it in a little bit later. And then we're going to add some pickle as well. So I'm just going to trim the top and the bottom. You can do, you know, it calls for a tablespoon of minced pickle. I'm just going to do the whole pickle because I like pickles and I know that they have nice probiotic material if they're fermented in the right way from the right place at the right time. So we're gonna add all that in there and you're done. You're, you can add salt to this, of course, as I mentioned. Um, and we're just gonna pulse this together. Cause I kind of like it to have these little chunks of all that veg stuff in there. Okay, did I forget anything? I didn't add the salt, half a teaspoon of salt. If that was intentional, you're done. So you can serve this in a lettuce leaf. You can um, make this a little bit um, creamier if you want. It's kind of like a tuna fish texture. If you want to add more water to it to make it a little creamier, but I like the kind of faux tuna pate experience. I think that um, folks are often confused when they see this, but then they try it and they're like, oh wow, this is really good. Is this tuna? No, nope, it's not tuna. It's just nuts and seeds. And it's really good for you. And of course, these are all soaked nuts and seeds. So as I mentioned, disinhibiting the phytic acid helps you to absorb all the nutrients in your nuts and seeds. So, woo, oh my goodness, two minutes to spare. Any questions or comments? I have used every bowl in the house, every spatula that there is. <laughs> and so um, there's a question from Susan. Things. Yeah. She wants to know how do you store the slow roasted tomatoes in olive oil in a jar or does it need refrigeration? I refrigerate them after cooking them. Yeah, okay. I just keep them in the refrigerator. They keep for a few months. Um, if you put them under olive oil, they would probably keep for much longer, mm -hmm. but I've never done that. And JM also said that you can use a dehydrator if you want it um, to That's prepare cool. the tomatoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have one of those, but um, I know people I. love it. So mm -hmm. it's something to play around with. That's a good idea. Okay, shall we check on our cheesecake? It's definitely not time yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think the instructions say, <coughs> excuse me, at least one hour. It's probably been about 30 minutes. So mm -hmm. let's go have a look. Yeah, as predicted, it's not there yet. So how do you know it's not there yet? You shake it and it's still got the jiggles. So it's gonna go back in for at least another hour or two, maybe. Um, but you just wanna let it keep cooling until it's completely cooled down and it's gonna solidify a bit more as it cools. Okay, questions, comments, everybody is ready to make some nice cooling raw summer dishes, enjoying some of the, you know, produce of the season. Thanks for being with me here today. Um, any final thoughts, Alita, over there? Um, you know, just um, thank yous. Um, Valerie said thank that she's you. been enjoying puff quinoa lately. So she, she, she puts 300 for three hours or something like that. Um, nice. People freeze basil and then they cook with it. 
Um, the texture suffers a little bit, but not the flavor. Um, great. That's really it. Just thank you, you know. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We have another class tomorrow, Flavors of Spain. And then I am off for two weeks, but I will be back mid-September. So our first class will be with Dr. Agarwal. The calendar's not out yet, but you can save the date. Um, it's going to be that Tuesday when, when I get back on, um, at about 5.30. So that's going to be, I think it's at the 14th of September. That'll be our next class after tomorrow. But join me tomorrow for Flavors of Spain. We're going to be making seafood paella and gazpacho. Of course, you have to make gazpacho at the end of summer, right? If you haven't made gazpacho yet, it's time. It's mm -hmm. time. Don't wait until it's too late. All right, everybody. Take care. Thank Be you. well. Enjoy. Bye -bye.